In the early 14th century, the great cities of Europe were flourishing. The climate was favorable for the makers of letters and the painters of pictures. With prosperity in the marketplaces, the castles and the cathedrals, there were patrons able and willing to pay for the books and the illustrations, which now tell us about those times. the great days of handwritten books and they were precious it took many tiring hours of work by a team of craftsmen scribes illuminators and bookbinders to make one single book so it's not surprising that it became an extremely valuable possession the cost of a book was high at the end of the 15th century you'd have had to pay as much as half a dozen geese two pairs of shoes or half a barrel of beer for a single page. That was a lot of money in those days. Here at Hereford Cathedral, they thought so highly of their books that not only did they lock them up, they chained them too. So if you wanted to borrow a book from a library in those days, you had to read it here, on the end of a chain. It took a team of craftsmen to make these treasured objects. The sheets of sheepskin or scraped calfskin, vellum, that were the pages, were prepared by the parchmenter. The text would be written out by the scribe. Red letters and headings would be executed by the rubricator. Decoration and gold would be added by the limner or illuminator. If there was a musical score, the notes were added by the notor. But to begin with, there was a job for the apprentice. He had to make straight lines to write on. The first thing that you would do um, after you'd scrape the skins would be to take a, a bodkin or something of that kind and prick through several thicknesses of vellum at once so that when you came to rule up the book, all of the lines would match up. If I turn it here, you'll see on this side of the page where he'd scored straight through and on the other side of the page it stands up so that you don't have to rule on both sides. One side will do. For every three scribes, there were, in well-organized scriptoriums, at least one person who was full-time checking the work. I've just been looking through, and I can see here, for instance, if you look, he's made a mistake with the music and has had to scratch it out. Scribes had a system of marking in the margins and pointing to where a mistake was made. And sometimes they would even make fun of their own errors by painting little hands pointing in the middle of the text to the place where a word was missing. And on occasions I've seen where um, a whole phrase, missing phrase, has actually been rewritten, a little box put around it, and a team of, of cartoon men with ropes and pulleys are seen dragging the little box with the error in it up here where another man, another workman, is pointing to the place where the little phrase has been missed. There is no team to help a modern scribe. He must be parchmenter, rubricator, limner and notary in one man. And he may not have an apprentice. He must check his own pages and he'll still make mistakes. Something's happening here which I can see and that is that if I go on writing at the same size, I'm not going to fit in into the ribbon that I've drawn. So that I have no option. I'm going to have to start again. But it isn't such a disaster because, like my predecessors in the Middle Ages, um, there are ways of getting rid of mistakes. And what I have to do is take a very sharp knife and because vellum has several layers of skin, I can quite safely scrape away one of the upper layers. When I said that my predecessor in the Middle Ages, if you actually look at an old manuscript, you'll find quite often 
that he has made a mistake and has had to scrape it off. The only difference is that you can probably tell quite easily because once I finish scraping, the surface is never quite as smooth as when I started. And over the centuries, the dirt tends to gather in the places where the corrections have been made. And so, as much as 600 years later, his mistake is found out. And I've scraped off all of the ink. Um, the surface of the skin is still a little bit rough. So I burnish it down with my thumbnail, try and get it to as smooth as the rest of the vellum. And the next thing I do is to dab onto it, over the part that I've repaired, a little gum sandwrack powder. And that prevents the ink from spreading. And I'm going to try another little trick. So I'm going to join the W to the A as I go along. And it's strange, but the I is very forgiving as long as the impression of the letter is there. The I will skip one letter to, from one letter to another and read the whole word. And I'm using it to compress the word to fit. The modern scribe's patrons are likely to be mayors and corporations, private collectors, or the queen for royal letters, and occasionally someone who wants his favorite poem illuminated. The first scribes were early monks, and their works were always religious. Looking inward behind monastery walls, their concern was with matters spiritual. Later, the lay scribes, looking outward on the world, reflected the harsh realities of the age. Northern Europe, ravaged by the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War, death, plague and the sword were often illustrated. The martial arts provided a hope of triumphing over evil. The shapes of the letters used by northern scribes began to reflect this. They developed Gothic, with its letters upright and spiky. This northern script changed the character of the letters inherited from the Emperor Charlemagne. The crucial letter O, for example. We call O the mother of the alphabet because inside this rounded shape of the O we can find echoed the shapes of many of the others. The letter T, the letter U, the letter S, all fit snugly within the the basic O shape, so that when we consider the way in which the letter O has changed over the centuries, we're talking about also the shape, the changing shape of the, of the entire alphabet. We started off, we say, in the Carolingian time with a rounded, circular, practically circular O, which over the years has been compressed made more angular until eventually we end up with the Gothic style of letter, which is thick, black, strong, and geometrical in its shape. So that when we write up here the A and B and the C in the, in the um, Carolingian script, and, yet, and we write down here the same letters of the alphabet in the Gothic, we can see that we have quite a different characteristic, compressed, rich, dark stripes of letters marching across the page. Northern script. The southerners thought it brutal and christened it Gothic after the Goths, the barbarians. This black letter writing was in keeping with the cold, grey cities of the north. But in the south, they admired an older and gentler script. 
the Italians rejected the stripy, strong, harsh shapes of the Gothic black letter, which was going on in the rest of Europe at that time. It didn't reflect the way they felt about life. <laughs> The Italians still had the lettering of Imperial Rome, and from this evolved the capitals of a new script. Its small letters sprang from Charlemagne's style. itself with its open, light, free-flowing shapes reflected a growing interest in the life of classical Rome. What we call the Italic hand was the basis of everyday handwriting at the time and people like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo wrote in what you could call an Italic script. This style was also adopted by the papal secretariat so that when a letter would go out from the Vatican it would send an example of italic writing to every country in Christendom. A fair Italian hand the teachers called it. To the lawyers and bankers of Italy it was the chancery script. It became the style of writing used by diplomats and by the men of learning in the new universities of Europe. Italic replaced Gothic as the handwriting of the rich and powerful. Elizabeth I was taught Italic writing by her tutor. Mary Queen of Scots wrote her love letters in it. And when Philip II of Spain issued orders for the invasion of Elizabeth's England by his armada, they too were in Italic. <laughs> The demand for books and for the writing of documents grew. For the protection of their ancient arts and mysteries, the scribes and book producers were by now formed into guilds. These were approved and regulated, as they still are, by the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen of the City of London. The worshipful company of stationers and the company of scriveners between them held a monopoly over book production and the writing of legal and commercial documents. There were fortunes to be made. Drawing up legal documents for merchants and landowners gave the scriveners inside knowledge. And before long, many were acting as financial advisors, brokers, and even money lenders. The scrivener was not always popular. A creature begot by a pen and hatched up in an ink pot, it was said. Secure in their guilds, the scribes and book producers were at a peak of prosperity. It was the golden age of the penman. But the printing press arrived. The printed book spelt the end for the scribe, just as surely as later the motor car did to the horse. It broke his monopoly and easily outran him. No scribe could compete with the machine. In the 50 years after printing was invented in Germany, in the middle of the 15th century, six million books came off the presses. A printer could run off 120 pages in an hour, while a scribe could write only one.
movable metal type was the tool of the printer. The scribe had only his quill, and he finally gave up. Writing and arithmetic are taught with care and speed by Samuel Thomas. Ruined by the printing press, many a scribe turned to teaching and became the writing master. Others set up in the marketplace, letter writer for hire. The writing master needed to attract customers. He needed to distribute hundreds of leaflets to bring them in. He needed examples to inspire them. A new copybook of a small Italian hand. He needed the printer. But the printer must be cheap, and he must reproduce the individual style of each writing master. Movable type couldn't do that, but engraving could. Barry Turner. This is a copper plate which I'm just putting the finishing touches to a letter G. This, this type of copper plate can only be cut by hand because of the uh, amount of uh, flourishes and this type of work. It's impossible to do on a machine. On this uh, G, which I'm finishing off now, we put what is called a, a rough grain on the bottom because being very heavy, it does... It, it does need to have a rough bottom on it to hold the ink. A finer letter, we will just leave it with a concave bottom on it. I'm now just about to start work on the flourishes. The plate is balanced on a, what we call a sandbag which ena enables you to hold your hand still, yet swivel the plate round to cut the flourishes. Now the tool remains exactly in the same position all the time. It's just the plate which is pushed round by the other hand. You just sl very slowly move, smooths the bottom out and rounds it very, very slightly to enable the middle to be slightly deeper than the sides, which of course uh, makes it hold the ink. The magnifying glass is a three inch focus, which you must use even, even on a plate of this size, because you can't possibly do it with a naked eye. And a lot of the, of the Actual engravings we do work on are maybe the lettering of a sixteenth of an inch. When I first get the plate, the, uh, the first thing to do is to fill it all in with ink, all the grooves, dots, or whatever. And um, when it's completely full of ink, which you can see by the ink in the line, after you've polished it, it shines back at you you push it in with this dabber which is um, covered with felt which holds the ink and pushes it into the groove. You have to polish off the, the largest amount of ink with the canvas which takes it down to the surface of the plate and then you polish the surface of the plate with your hand which uh, takes off the oil oily residue of ink, which takes it down to the, the metal. Every printer had drummed into him from the days when he was first apprenticed that every trace of ink had to be removed from the surface of the plate. Inking the palm of the hand gives a tackiness which makes the French chalk stick, and the hand is then used as a burnisher to polish the plate clean. The important thing is not to wipe the ink out of the grooves, then all you're left with is the ink that's in the work and the plate. 
That's really... Let's see. A well-engraved copper plate would print several hundred identical impressions before it wore out, each one extending the influence of the writing master and his favorite style. With the surface polished and the ink in the grooves ready to make the impression, it was critical that the right kind of paper should be used. It had to be strong and yet flexible enough to be pressed into the grooves to take the ink without tearing. The paper, originally made from rags, was slightly dampened in a trough of water before being placed under the roller. A felt blanket formed a cushion between the hard roller and the moistened paper. It helped to force the paper into the ink-filled grooves. One inky thumbprint or a spot of ink left on the surface of the plate could ruin the effect. It was said in the trade that the amateur with clean hands got his work dirty, but the professional with dirty hands kept his work clean. The copper plate could carry every individual curl and flourish of the penman's art, an art that had developed in contrast to the uniformity of the printed letter. The elaborate engraving enslaved generations of children. of one boy from the time when he was 10 until the time he was 13 shows what could be done. This is an example of writing done in a small country school by Richard James when he was 10 years of age, Christmas 1854. And he would bring this home to show his parents that he'd been well schooled in the art of penmanship. And as each year went by, he added more to it. And also, as well as writing, an example of his studies into history and geography. And here we have a, a beautifully drawn account of the battle at Sevastopol with little colloquial sketches of the terrain and the disposition of the troops. Um, the sort of things a small boy would really be excited and interested in. He certainly has a great deal of skill um, with that little goose quill or crow quill pen. Little bit of advertising for the school, of course, didn't come amiss. And I dare say that that was in the teacher's mind when he set this little bit of a problem for the children. But look at the restraint shown in the downward sweep of that pen as the pressure of the goose quill was applied and the releasing of pressure as the gently raising it upwards to give us the thin mark. And then each letter elegantly spaced with a nice measured tread as the whole word proceeds. A lovely piece of work. I don't think many 13-year-olds could do as well today. Neither could many of them then. But Victorian pupils labored on in the belief that their future prosperity depended on a good hand. These have been done to show you how the letters are built up. A beginning stroke so that the ink begins to run freely in the pen. A thickish downstroke, a thin upstroke, and a thick downstroke. Now don't be afraid to take your pens off the paper when you think it's going to be easier. Round we go then, press down. Their future employers demanded copper plate, but as a style it was fancy, pretentious, and difficult. Downstroke. Now, Cumberland, why isn't that one terribly good? Well, it's a bit heavy there. It's a bit heavy, yes. It was hard on the boys. It was hard, too, on the quill pen. This quill feels 
very nice to handle. It's light in the fingers and it's flexible. The only problem is, of course, that in trying to imitate the engraver's letter form, with this sharply pointed quill, we placed a great deal of uh, strain on the material. The quill itself tends to soften by constantly being dipped into the ink. And because it has a very sharp point on the end, it very soon wears out. Another problem also, which has constantly bothered scribes throughout the ages, even without the narrow tip on the end, has been the problem that the two halves of the pen, the pen point, tend to open out and make the writing much thicker than we want it to. So, you can think with all these problems, the quill, being, in spite of it being a beautiful thing to use, it goes soft. The pen opens and it gets blunt on the end. And that's what we mean by blotting your copybook. the steel nib. The lavish curves of the copper plate strangle the goose quill after 2,000 years of service. Steel nibs took over, mass produced by the engines of the Industrial Revolution. From the day when the first Egyptian painted hieroglyphics with a reed brush, the story of writing moved slowly but inevitably towards this. By the time of the Industrial Revolution, 5,000 years of developing styles of lettering had produced the Victorian copperplate hand. It was a time when every man aspired to write and every hand wanted something to write with. The Victorian's answer was this, the steel nib. The workshop of the world was Birmingham, and this was where the first successful steel pen nibs were developed. There had been many attempts to invent something that would replace the quill pen, but it was Birmingham in the 1830s that triumphed. Birmingham button makers developed a special hand press for cutting 
and shaping steel blanks. They found that the same method could be used for nib. The Birmingham pen makers call the new product the steel pen. They still do. We just call it a nib. To them it was a source of pride. They employed nearly 5,000 people but paid them very little. On the night shift the girls had to bring their own candles. But mother would introduce daughter to the pen press and there was a family pride in the product. Second generation pen maker Ray Handley. My old foreman always used to say for me many years ago, they say, pen making was an art, you know, and he, you know, when you talk about um, the jewellery trade, which is a similar sort of thing in a way, because we make, uh, well, years ago they used to make so many different patterns. I can remember even uh, 30 years ago, uh, we made 700, 800, probably 900 different patterns of pens, and they all had different shapes different sizes. The elbow pen, named because of its elbow-like curve, was popular because it followed the natural bend of the old goose quill. The pen makers rivaled each other to satisfy the latest drawing room fashions. And Charles Hughes, Charles Brandauer and William Mitchell became household names. Mitchell was one of the first, without a doubt, and, and it was quite a... Uh, how can I put it? It was quite a a competition between them when one man started because obviously here we have a pen we use it we throw it away we make another pen it is a commodity that is com that can be made and thrown away and then made another one you see it, uh, and, and people started to think that well we can make money out of this obviously and because then it started <laughs> By 1900, Birmingham pen makers were exporting over 500 million nibs each year. The world wrote with the Birmingham steel pen. pen was much better than the quill for carrying out the kind of style that the copper plate engraver had introduced. Because of its greater strength, it meant that the pen didn't wear out so quickly and one could write much longer passages and you simply just had to pick a new one up instead of having to retrim with the knife and all the kind of thing you had to do with the quill. The steel pen, by contrast, could go on for page after page without wearing out, it didn't need repairing, and this meant that all of the skill could go into the writing itself. The uh, attractiveness of this style derives from the contrast which you get between the thin upstrokes and the thick downstrokes which are brought about by pressure. Light on the up and pressure on the down gives us a graduated stroke uh, which is very attractive and of course it became the fashion uh, for many uh, people to introduce their own system of teaching, um, published books and so on. One of these, the most famous in America, for instance, was called the Palmer Method. One of the most memorable things about that is that one was exhausted as a child to push and pull, push, pull, push, pull, for endless exercises before one graduated to actually writing the letters themselves. This style, copper plate or whatever style you call it is very easily recognizable because even today we still when we want to create a feeling of formality and elegance 
Uh, we use it on visiting cards and wedding invitations, impressive invoices, and grade looking banknotes. <laughs> post encouraged writing. In the days before the telephone, people chatted by post, and a well-written letter became not only a practical way of communicating, but an art in itself. has a flowing property peculiar to itself and does not corrode metallic pens as other inks do. So advertised an ink manufacturer of the 19th century. A steel nib needed a new ink. Medieval inks were acid and burnt into the writing surface. The quill could take this, but the steel pen rusted. They experimented with dyes and in the 1850s produced an ink that would not corrode and would not fade. The penman demanded ink that would run freely, but not spread. It must not smell or become moldy. It must dry easily. It must not attack the paper or the nib. Fine writing ink could be bought in powdered form and then mixed at home, or ready-made in jars, or just occasionally still from the travelling ink vendor. From his barrels it would be decanted like wine. If you wanted to write, you went to the desk, of course. Pen and ink may have been splendidly enshrined, but they weren't intended to be portable. The problem of how to carry writing equipment about with you fascinated Victorian inventors. This shop in the West End of London, itself something of a collector's item, is a memorial to their ingenious minds and inky fingers. Pen collector and enthusiast, Philip Poole. Here we have one of the many examples of an effort to make an instrument which could be carried around by a traveller. In the end here we have the quill pen with which he would have written.
And then the other end of the instrument, he would have carried some ink. This is a type of writing instrument which would have been carried by travellers in the Middle East. Here we have the inkwell, and in the tube is the pen, which incidentally is a reed pen. This is an amusing example of a silver pen holder which could be used by a traveller. The pen nib could be taken out and folded back into the holder. This would be used to carry a small bottle of ink and the whole lot could be taken apart to form a gentleman's watch chain. Carrying ink around, of course, was always a messy business and inventors were always trying to work out a method whereby the ink could be carried in the pen holder itself. Here we have the fountain pen and here we have the device whereby the ink could be put into the pen. Early attempts at fountain pens came in many shapes and sizes and there were many ingenious devices. Here is one early example which has a kind of tubular nib into which was inserted a solid cartridge of ink. The nib curved downwards and the idea behind this was that when it was dipped into water, ink could be produced. Needless to say, this was not entirely successful. Here we have another interesting example of an early fountain pen, probably about 1900, which has an ingenious mechanism which is retractable. The purpose behind this was that if the pen nib was retracted into the barrel, it could not be damaged when not in use. Finally, we come to a pen which I suppose we could regard as a bit of a joke, I think. The idea of this is that because of its size and bulk, it would be difficult to lose. Difficult to lose, but also difficult to use. Those early attempts at portable pens look now like an amusing hiccup on the route from the old hand-cut quill pen to the mass-produced fountain pen. A high-speed carborundum wheel cuts through a gold nib in microseconds. A specially hardened material is welded to the tip of the nib and polished on every side to provide by machine the writing point once carefully cut by hand. into a prized possession, a jewel almost, in a way that a goose quill never could. This 
pen can write five miles without stopping. Popular, cheap, unloved by writers of fine lettering, this is our century's contribution to the writing instrument. The ball point. The principle is of the controlled leak, a rotating ball fed with ink through six tiny channels surrounding it. Pen makers began to experiment with a ballpoint pen at the beginning of this century. They wanted something for warehouse men to use on the uneven surfaces of packages covered by linen and brown paper. Quick drying, with an inbuilt ink supply, the ballpoint is the office workhorse and often the throwaway pen. The direct descendant of the pen family remains the fountain pen. Its predecessors, reeds and quills, were cut at home. The fountain pen is prepared in a factory. Pen tester, Francis Thatcher. First of all, I'll check to make sure there's no defects on the mirror. Then um, I'll write with them and uh, check the smoothness and the correct flow. Well, I'll catch the nibbles too tight, so you get hold of a spot they call a spreader and just put it through. And that will open your point. And uh, then you can adjust, adjust the flow to how you want it. So it might have a too flexy it in there. Because if it's too flexy, it won't write. Put them on an overnight start. And then in the morning, it has got to start as you put pen to paper. And every one is written with. It's all, all a matter of feel. You can feel if there's anything wrong with the neck, even though if you haven't looked at it. You can feel it on the, as soon as you put it down on the paper. Even though our shiny modern pens are made nowadays by sophisticated machines, they're basically the same kind of writing instrument that man's always used. I mean, this fiber chip pen is really no different from the Egyptian reed brush. year, rumours are rife that a machine, the typewriter, will supersede the scribe. The operator, a lady, says she can get through 40 sheets an hour. An anguished scribe wrote this in 1889. What would he have said today? Telephones, typewriters, electronic word processors, computers, which at the touch of a key can produce over 1,000 typed letters per hour. The scribe can't compete. The first time he was hit by technology by the printing press five centuries ago, he took refuge in the classroom as the writing master. Today he's called a calligrapher, from the Greek words for beautiful writing. He can no longer make a living by copying books. His handwriting isn't wanted in banks and offices where the typewriter rules. The calligrapher responds to the threat of technology not only as a teacher, but as artist and designer. 
an artist takes his brush and puts it in his palette and paints onto a canvas. We've been brought up with the idea that this is what an artist does and he paints pictures and that's art. But we're not so familiar with the idea that writing can be art. Now a calligrapher takes everyday objects, letter forms, which we take for granted. We see them in the street, we see them in all sorts of mundane situations, and we push them, we pull them, we make them smaller, we, we arrange them like this in a, shall we say here, we have a piece of writing with various pieces of textural writing in it, different weights of letters that I'm moving around at the moment. I'm trying to sort of make my mind up about how I'm going to make a series of words which I want to write into a composition um, with certain symbols which I want to pull together. Making of marks, making of pictures, making of letters is as much to do with arranging and leaving space as it is with making black marks. Every time you make a mark on a white space, you change all the white. You make a black mark, every bit of the white changes. It's like taking a marble, uh, one marble out of a whole jar of marbles. You take one marble out, they all rearrange slightly. Burnished gold will make the angel the heart of this design. But the arrangement and the colouring of the letters, pushed and pulled around the page, will control the mood of the picture. The calligrapher places letters as a painter places his colours. To me, as important as the overall positioning of the figure is the positioning of the words and the weight of the words, heavy stripes and light stripes. They're all part of it. They're just as much part of it as the wings. So I'm going to write here the last line that I've got ready to put into that. And the thing I'm going to be watching for is to try and get a slight movement upwards to reflect this here. The writing is the most important part of this. The pattern, the dark stripes against the light stripes, creating a texture and a mood. The calligrapher makes every letter by hand, so he is free to experiment with their shape. He's part of a tradition stretching back thousands of years. Cave paintings, hieroglyphics, Roman script, Carolingian, Gothic, Italic, copper plate all behind him. What is ahead? It is the calligrapher who will shape the letters of the future. He's not the only influence, of course. Technology has already demanded one new and ugly set of letter shapes for the computer. But the best chance of beautiful letters must lie with a calligrapher. Now, so that I can pick up some of the little bits of red which are in the top part of this thing, I'm going to use red to write in a little, just the last remaining words of the inscription. I'm using another texture of writing, not the rich black, but an open, fine hand with more light showing through it. And the red gives a little kick to the rest, so that apart from the playing with the letter shape themselves, which are in themselves a thin, elegant character, I'm also using colour to bring out a mood. Letters themselves as shapes have a sort of magic for me. I've got 2,000 years of inspiration to choose from letter forms as they've evolved over the centuries. We're lucky nowadays because we've got references, we can look back and we can choose anything that we really like over preceding thousands of years and use them as we wish today. A hundred years from now the position hopefully will be the same. What you've got is a pen and if you look at it very closely, if you look at it sideways You've got a sort of bevel. It slopes Every time we write a letter, we make a set of patterns. Every one of them is different, because we are all different. Every mark we make says something about us. Each letter we draw reveals our character and feelings. Impatience, determination, energy, caution, 
recklessness, generosity. Ugly or elegant, our handwriting speaks for us and for our time. If I remember the thick and the thin, that you're using the thick and the thin. Do you see, like here? Every mark we make is like a fingerprint in time, which will tell the future what we were like, just as by looking at the writing of the past, we can find out what they were like. Good. That's a very, very nice sheet. Thousands of years ago, a man whose words have outlived his name wrote, all the possibilities of a human being can flow from the point of a pen. Super. Lovely. Keep going. Let it flow. Keep the flow going.